complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. We asked participants to recreate bar graphs. When the bar was alone, we saw a different pattern of error than when the bar was presented with context in a stacked bar graph. We find that absolute error increased for higher bars when they were presented alone. We also found that there was a bias in the responses such that they were repulsed from an implicit 50% mark. We found a magic number, 10%, to predict error. Participants are usually within 10% of the height of the bar. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Do these three essays construct their argumentation similarly? Where in this table of argumentation data from the previously seen texts can I find certain argumentation patterns? Do these three argument maps depict the same argument? We have developed a visual analysis system for argumentation in essays that can answer these questions at a glance. You want to know how it works? Come to my talk. We demonstrate that people can use the spatial cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications. And we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variante. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytic system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. This is a picture of a Tableau visualization within the browser. The data behind the visualization does not exist here, and Tableau is not running. This is just an image. However, parts of this image are fully interactive. Please join our presentation to see how we can share interactive visualizations across the web, free from any dependency on data or visualization application. We present PowerViz, a tool for visualizing hypergraphs where edges can connect any number of nodes. PowerViz is the first technique to display hyperedges with no overlap or crossing. Vertices are represented as rows, time periods flow from left to right, and groups can be shown on the left. We designed the layout for readability. PowerViz shines with mid-sized hypergraphs and it allows detailed analysis. We tested PowerViz successfully using publication datasets and data from historical documents. Morse complexes have shown a great utility in understanding the topology of complex scientific datasets. The noise in the scalar field, however, can significantly distort the Morse complex topology. Hence, we study the extraction of Morse complexes for ensembles of noisy scalar fields through their uncertainty visualization using our proposed statistical summary maps. We present NL4DV, a toolkit that helps prototype natural language interfaces for data visualizations. 
NL4GV provides a high-level Python API for interpreting natural language queries. The API automates the core tasks of processing natural language queries to infer relevant information and determine appropriate visualizations, allowing visualization developers to focus more on designing and implementing the user interface. We present Lyra 2, a system for designing interactive visualizations by demonstration. To design interactions in Lyra 2, users directly manipulate the visualization canvas. The system interprets demonstrations using heuristics and suggests possible interaction designs. We find that Lyra 2 enables rapid prototyping of an expressive range of interaction designs. We're excited to share this work with you. The classifier trained on the historical data may fail to classify the incoming data when the data distribution is changing. This phenomenon is called concept drift. To handle the concept drift, we developed the DriftViz, a visual analytic system to help the expert understand when, where, and why the drift happens, and update the model to improve performance. Position is believed to be the most precise encoding channel, but our perception and memory of it can still be biased. Past work has shown that the vertical position of bars in a bar chart is recalled in a biased manner illustrating both an underestimation and overestimation bias of position. Here we find that the aspect ratios of the bar marks can cause this position bias, specifically resulting in overestimation for bars with wide ratios and underestimation for bars with tall ratios. VisaVis is a visual support system for the development of visualization algorithms. It has live compilation, automatic version control, predefined interactions, and tools for visual parameter analysis. By displaying the complete history of the algorithm, users get insights into the correlation between source code changes and visual differences. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Spot SDC is a visualization system that helps researchers understand the resiliency of HPC computation kernels to silent error corruptions. It gives users multiple perspectives of details with different granularity about the impact of SDC on an application's output. It also provides novel insight into how silent error propagates through a program's execution. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. How many clusters can you see in these images? With different visual recordings in scatter plots, our perception of cluster count changes. We developed models that consider how visual density influences cluster perception. Further, we demonstrate using a threshold plot to optimize the saliency of clusters. In our current work, we visually compare two cohorts of segmented and classified tissue images originated from single-cell omics data. To that end, we developed data-driven and interactive workflow 
implemented in a multi-linked view system. Finally, we show the effectiveness of our workflow through specific case studies. Suppose you want to see the overall coming structure of a new project repository. Using git class tools, github network, or git log command, it's quite burdensome to get overview and navigate data. We presented Gizru as an interactive visual analytics system for the Git metadata to help users explore and understand the context of development history. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Taylor coir flows is a turbulent fluid motion created in the gap between the two rotating cylinders. The traditional reason-based methods are only able to capture the small-scale coherent structure. The detection of the large structure depends on the 2D uh, cross-section, which is not the true configuration. We adapt the feature level set methods and the density. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, second session of this in practice. Um, for this session, we have a very exciting talk from Jane Zhang, and then we will have a very interesting panel discussion. Um, so first, we will have Jane give her talk, um, Self-Employed Data Visualization Designers Making a Living. Uh, Jane is an independent data visualization designer from Toronto, Canada. Jane designs learning experiences that is driven by user-centered design. Her work shows people how to think about something by compartmentalizing information. As an independent, Jane shares her journey and experiences navigating the business through her articles on the Nightingale publication and her newsletter, The Wanderings of a Database Designer. Without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Jane. Thank you. Hi, Hi my name is Jane, um, and I am data I designer from Toronto, there is Canada. For this, right? Today I'm talking about how okay. self-employed data visualization designers make a living. 
I previously worked at Kantar. I was a data designer. Kantar is a market research firm based in the UK. And I was working right in the now? Toronto office. Yeah. I left my job last summer. So 20, 2019 summer, I left to pursue freelancing. Towards the end of 2019, I felt quite lost. No direction. I started to think a lot about how do I make this work. You know, I started to ruminate. I was going in circles. It wasn't very healthy. So I need to do something about it. And um, I heard this really great tip from a TED Talk. Um, it said that to address rumination, it, the best way to do it is to turn that into a question. Because when it's a question, it's something that can be solved. And so I decided to do that. And what I did was I asked, how do self-employed data visualization designers make their money? I addressed this question and turned it to four designers. So I talked to these four, Ali Turbin, um, RJ Andrews, Anki Emery, and Matt Baker. I wrote about my insights in the Data Visualization Society publication called Nightingale um, at the same title. And this talk will expand on this article and I'm going to include a couple more insights I didn't mention there. This topic is very much not talked about. Um, it's very much behind the curtains. Um, and the way I've structured this talk is to target to people who are earlier in their career who are considering uh, freelancing, whether part-time or full-time. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly start and go over the kind of work I do. So I generally consider my work in two streams, and this is a recent development. Um, I'm constantly changing, but currently I have two streams. The first is visual world. And what I mean by that is I, I want to do work that integrates data viz into everyday life. So beyond reports, beyond dashboards, can we do more with, with data viz? So the example I have here is, and this is a personal project, is I integrate data viz into a food menu, which allows people to quickly compare food items and help them make a choice. The second stream is um, data documentaries. And I uh, approach data documentaries as a way to gain insight into the human condition. And I think of it like a film documentary, except it's condensed through time. And um, personally for me, what I do is I wanted to uh, document my mental health and physical health. And I did that for three months. And so this is this is the project for that. And um, I wanted insight into how I can live better because I had a lot of muscle tension re reacting to stress and anxiety, but I didn't know how, what to do about it. I tried to seek help, but it wasn't very helpful. So. Um, I collected data on that and I gained a lot of insights. A lot of it was actionable. So one thing I learned um, by being very present with, with the data and collecting it was, um, you know, one feeling I felt was overwhelmed. And that was a feeling I was never able to identify before doing this project. And so that's a very important part of this. And it, it, it allows me to build this self-awareness, which is actually very hard to do. And so this is a, these are the main two streams of work I, I am doing now. So I'll talk a little bit about um, everyone I talk to and why they started what they do. So first is RJ Andrews. He is a data storyteller at InfoWord Trust. He started doing freelance graphic design uh, work and in marketing as well. Uh, one day he had a friend who asked him to do an ambitious data story project. He decided to publish it online and that's when he created InfoWord Trust website. So you probably know him from InfoWord Trust, the book he wrote, um, and also Creative Routines, which is a very popular piece of work he did. Um, and I think the key thing to learn here is that uh, it's important to show the work you do. So he published a lot of his work on his website and helped him build a lot of brand awareness. And the key thing here, I think, um, is it actually eventually paid off. So in the summer of 2015, he was going, he was applying, he was moving to San Francisco and um, he got two unsolicited jobs. Um, one promised $30,000, the other one promised $20,000. and. You know, he was going to go to San Francisco, San Francisco to get a, just a, a normal tech job. Um, but with these two requests, he saw it as, as signals to, in his own words, forget working for a big company, keep chasing this dragon. Ali is a data visualization designer at the American Enterprise Institute. And she's also the host of a popular podcast called Data Viz Today. Ali was originally a software tester and a data analyst for government clients. Um, when she was working, um, there before, uh, she welcomed a new family member. She had um, a, a child and she had to stop working. And um, during that time, she she was reflecting on how to re-enter the workforce and how to, what, what to do that maybe something that she would enjoy a bit better. And one thing that she um, came to the conclusion of was data visualization design. But she has no background in design or data visualization, right? She, she comes from an analyst background. And so 
um, what she decided to do was start her own podcast. So she started Dating Viz today. And she created this incredible workflow where she was able to build a network. So she reached out to people to talk about their process. Um, and what she would then do is apply that and so that she can incorporate it. She can gain those skills. So she would apply the, the things that she learned from people she talked to. Um, here's an example of what she made after speaking to Sonia from Studio Perp. Um, and and uh, I think I think what she did was she was able to teach herself all these skills through her podcast. Um, one thing that Ali mentioned to me during the interview um, was she says you're what you constantly think about. And I think what that means to her was she didn't let her lack of experience stop her from doing what she wanted to do. She said, I don't need to ask anyone for permission. For her, it was enough for her to, to think about it, to really want it and um, surround herself with data viz. What she used to do was she would cut, you know, things off of um, Washington Post newspaper and put in her notebook just so it was there, so she, she could think about it. And I think there's a lot we can learn from how she approached her career. Matt Baker, he is Canadian, uh, like me. He is a designer at Useful Charts. Um, he makes these massive posters that he sells to educators around the world. Um, so lately he's been doing a lot of family trees. In 2009, he returned uh, from Sri Lanka. He was teaching English abroad, he returned to Canada. And um, he was recently divorced and he had young children. So he was a single father and he was unemployed. Um, and he needed a way to still work and take care of his children. So what he decided to do was learn how to build websites. He learned HTML, uh, he set up Google AdSense, um, and he started his online business. So he started doing various things. Um, and what I find interesting about how he adapted in terms of work was he adapted around his family. Um, and this comes to an important point. So uh, in Chinese, there is a term um, called Xia Hai, which actually translates directly to entering or descending into the sea. Um, and ch people in China would say this term kind of you know, casually to, to say, I'm starting a business, or I'm starting something new and leaving something like maybe leaving a salary job, something that's a bit more secure. And I think this metaphor is very much denoting this idea of risk, um, unknowns, right? You know, there's a lot of things that might not work out. Um, and it's very, very scary to start a business, right? It's, it's never easy. And I also think there's never a really good time to do it. There's no right time to do it. I think in the case of Matt, he probably did it a little earlier than he was ready for it because of his circumstances. And I asked him, do you think if it wasn't for your situation, would you have started to do what you did? Would you have started to learn how to build an online practice, an online business? And he said, I've never thought of it like that, but I think maybe you're right. I think I would have just found a job in the city somewhere and I wouldn't have started it right then and there. But I think RJ would have started it, and I'm sorry, I, I think Matt would have started it anyways, um, because he has that entrepreneurial drive. And as the last person I spoke to, she is a speaker and trainer at Depict Data Studio. She comes from the evaluation world. So she helps her clients, you know, turn charts that look like this into something like this, which is a lot more accessible, a lot more engaging, uh, easier to read. Um, Anne's story is really interesting. So she and her husband uh, were traveling one summer and they met a retired couple living out of RV. So the husband of that older couple did consulting and worked part time. And um, Anne turned to her husband and said, someday when I'm retired, I want to teach people data viz. You know, I'm going to work through my work through my career right now and then retire and just do this thing. And um, her husband just laughed at her and said, why not do it right now? And so I think that was a very first step for her to do what she's doing now, which is putting her dreams into words. And I think that's a very fir scary first step because it takes a lot of courage to say what you want to do and, and commit and see, follow it through. But there's a chance that it might not work out. Right? Even, even for myself, when I was saying, I just told, I, I just mentioned how I do visit the world data documentaries. A couple of months ago, I, I couldn't even say that. I would just was stutter because it just sounded ridiculous. Um, and I was just like, this is not going to work out. It's going to fail. But when I finally decide to commit to it, regardless if it works out or not, I feel like a sense I can move on with it and try it out. So I think that's what happened with Anne. She put those um, her, her ambitions into her words and she executed on it. Income. So um, I had a very narrow perspective on how one makes money in DataViz. I thought I had to be very service centric. I thought I had to get clients. Um, but I'm learning that after I talk to everyone, it's not like that. There, there's a diversity, many, many ways to, to earn an income as a data designer. And 
Um, so I asked everyone for their income distribution for 2019. So RJ, um, he's mostly uh, freelancing, so he does long-term projects, short-term projects, um, and speaking in workshops. So long-term, 60%, short-term, 20%, speaking workshops, 20%. Um, Ali, uh, so she works remotely and part-time for American Institute um, while she's still raising her young family. Um, 70% comes from that, 20% freelancing, podcast 5%, speaking 5%. Matt Baker is the most interesting. Most of his income comes from poster sales alone. Uh, of course, he's spent many years building that practice, but it's, it's interesting how he's not very diverse in terms of how he makes his income. And 10% comes from YouTube ads. NK Emery, 50% income, uh, in-person training, 30% online courses, 16% webinars, consulting keynotes, 4% digital products, YouTube ads. She's probably the most diverse and most well-rounded <laughs> of everyone I spoke to. Income stream. So I think um, when I was trying to understand or like a certain model of how people can make money in this field, um, I tend to have these two in mind. So first, service a product. To have to have to provide a service, you need a specialized skill. Usually, this isn't scalable. You do this one on one with a client, for example. Um, once you have some experience and you have developed and honed the specialized skill, I think then what you can do is provide consulting, teaching, or speaking, and can build this further and start building up products. So products are more scalable. So you can build digital or physical products. Digital would be things like courses, webinars. Physical would be things like books and posters. And I'll say the additional form of income, which is more common now, is content. So create podcasts, YouTube, um, and through that you can make money through affiliate marketing, Patreon sponsorships. So RJ, very service heavy, very service specific product. He has a book, so that would be, that's what where the physical will come in, physical product comes in. Um, Ali, she has a mix of service and content. She's got a podcast and she also still works uh, freelancing also at American Institute. Matt Baker, uh, I would argue that you still need a specialized skill to still make these physical products, but he doesn't offer this as a service. He just focuses on product. Um, and he also has a YouTube channel. And um, yeah, he has 200,000 subscribers. He does really well for himself. NK, the most uh, obviously well-rounded in terms of income streams. She does a little bit of everything. So this is, I think, um, really, really hard for anyone to know. Like, we're really good at knowing what we're not good at. <laughs> we're really good at seeing our weaknesses as people when we self-reflect, but we're not really good at seeing what we what we can do well. And I think it's just human nature, right? Um, you know, you more like criticize yourself than congratulate yourself. And I think um, to really find out what your value is, it really depends on working with others and listening to feedback. What do they tell you they value? What do they tell you that's helpful? So I still don't really know what my value is and I'm still working through that. Um, but I asked um, the people I talked to what their value was. So before I go into that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I mean by value and how to, how to, how to define it. So uh, generally what you have is a customer segment. So a customer would have customer jobs, so not in the sense of pay job, in the sense of what do they need to do every day, day to day. So there's a certain set of things that need to get done every day, and there's certain things that get in the way. So there's pains that get in the way of getting that done, and there's certain gains that can help get that done. As a provider, as a business, you create gain, you create things that will allow them to have these gains or things that can remove these pains. And I'm going to give you a really great example. So in Ontario, we have these freshwater turtles. They're called blanding, uh, blanding turtles, and they are uh, threatened. That's their status right now. And their main job, I think, um, is to be to uh, live long enough until adulthood, um, mate, you know, lay eggs and produce offspring for the next generation. I think that's their main job. <laughs> um, a big pain for them is habitat segmentation. So what that means is, um, you know, there's lots of roads built around where they live, um, and it, it becomes a problem because when they try to cross these roads. They're going to get killed so, so so they can't if they get killed they can't do their job they can't you know lay eggs and produce the next next generation right um a gain would be they would like to have is be able to uh, get to where they need and get there safely so one way to address this are these little tunnels so these tunnels you can um, they've, they've been built under some of these roads and it allows these turtles to cross safely so they don't die and they can do what they need to do and so i think as um providers we need to understand what is the value we offer and why would we be hired for our work? And I'm going to give you uh, a quote I heard from Elijah Meek. So he, at the time, was, um, uh, he had a call, set up a call with a lot of early career people 
and talk about you know how to build a portfolio. So he was with online with uh, Susie Liu and Jason Forrest, and he had this you know he mentioned something about value, and I'm gonna quote him. It's very long, but it's important to read through it. Five or ten years ago, it was very challenging to make some of these diagrams and some of these maps, and now there's an enormous number of extremely well designed and extremely powerful tools. And you hear quite often engineers or data scientists say, well, why should you do that? Why simply have a position that does that when I can make a chart in Tableau, Superset, Plotly in five minutes? Why have an entire job for data visualization? I would challenge all of you as you consider this as a career to answer that question, not necessarily answering the skills you have right now, but answer it in this sort of way. What are you building toward? Why is it that you think someone like myself can be successful in these kinds of careers? Because it does take more than technical skills to build one of these things, and it does hit on all of these ideas of design, collaboration, and being able to bring some sense of systemization addressing questions by stakeholders. That's a classic answer why design is a real profession and not just something that automated tools can take care of. Because I'll tell you something, they're not going to get less automated and less sophisticated by the time you spent 10 years in data visualization. You'll be 100 times better than they are now, and that question will be 100 times harder to answer. So I think um, it's important to acknowledge what he says in terms of what's to come. And when I asked RJ and Anne what they thought their value was based on their feedback from their clients, none of them mentioned any technical aspect of data viz. Um, so RJ, he said one of the most, um, I guess, under underestimated or underrated val uh, value he gives to, to his clients is the general skill of consulting. It's um, he, he calls himself the coordinating mechanism. He helps his clients focus their attention to a goal, get them on the same page. Um, when I asked Anne, she said, she gave me an example. Um, so she was teaching at this organization, a, a workshop, and one of the employees walked up to her almost in tears saying, you know, I've worked here for 20 years. I've worked here for a long time. Um, it was always so stressful working with data, but this is the first time I feel excited to work with my data. I think for people who don't have any data skills, working with data is uh, a huge pain to get their job done, right? And what Anne does is she makes that process less intimidating. She wears like fun t-shirts. She has these fun stickers on her laptop to make data less scary, to make it less intimidating. She makes it more fun. And both of, both of them, none of them mention any technical aspect. I think it's important to have the technical skills, but I don't think that's enough, especially if you're self-employed. Um, their value is dealing with human problems not technical problems. It's very much about dealing with people. And I think that's something that we have to understand as, as providers, as, um, as freelancers. And, but that's, the problem with that is it's really hard to show it. So, you know, I, I did this to you earlier on, right? I just showed you my work. I didn't talk about my process. Um, but how can we show the value we get? Because the value isn't this. It's not what you see it, you know, it's not what you see. It's what I do to get there. That's where the value is. It's the questions I ask you to help you solve problems. Upon writing that article, I, I, um, this article, an idea struck me, which is it's, um, it's important to expose how you think and not just what you can do. Um, it's important to show what you can do, but that's not enough. There's a saying in the startup world, or you know, people who do investments in businesses is uh, bet on the jockey, not the horse. And the idea is, I think, you know, it's important to, to, to see who is going to be behind this idea, how they would execute it. And same thing as, you know, freelancers. The work we make is, is important, but not as important as who we are. And we have to show that. We have to show how we think. And I think um, Anne does this really well. So she has been blogging since 2012. She shows her thinking, like, you know, what, what are some things she's been thinking about? And you realize her work is quite complex. And, and you know, you start to realize, oh, it really requires an ex, uh, ex expert to execute on this. So. Using a couple of posts I pulled from her website. Um, and you can really see how she can give you value, right? Um, she shows some of her, she talks about some of her insights and ways to approach certain things. So after I talked to everyone, what did I do? So I tried to do um, this more late, uh, lately is create these videos. So I would try to expose how I think. So for example, um, Recently, I was trying to learn how to create a data viz style guide. Never done that before, but I decided to learn how to do it for the first time. And I decided to record that process of learning how to do that, and um, I published it online. And 
I think what's helpful for people when they see this is they see how I think, I talk out loud, and I think that's very valuable because they see how I solve some problems I'm encountering. Um, here I'm recording, you know, behind the scenes. I use a lot of post-its, but you don't see that, right? A lot of people will just look at the final thing, but they don't see the process it takes to organize all this information and try to make sense of it, try to build a story. And so what's great about video, it's a, ver it's a very good way to create a relationship almost passively, right? I don't have to ever see you to, to build a relationship with you. You can see my video and develop a sense of trust in me and see how I work and sort of um, understand if I might be the right fit to help you do what you need to do. I'm very realistic about how I earn my money, and I, I'm very transparent about it. I talk to talk about it as well. I'm very open about it, and um, I had a very narrow view, right, on how to make money in data viz. But when I saw how everyone else was doing, it, I was a little bit more open about how to approach it. So I'm going to show you a matrix about how I understand this process. So I know where my level of work that's ideal for me, and I know what's not ideal for me. I'm also very conscious and aware of what's low in demand or high demand within the market. So for me, like the two streams I mentioned earlier on Visa Word Day documentaries, these are new things. These are things I made up, right? There's no demand for it at all. No one knows what it is. No one knows the value. But for me, it's something I want to do. Um, and I think to move this a little bit more here towards this direction, towards more demand, it requires a lot of education, a lot of you know concept testing and proofing. And that's just something that's going to take time. There's no way around it. Um, dashboards. So this isn't really ideal for me. I, um, you know, I got three requests for uh, for this last month, and I turned it down because there's something I can do for. It. I don't have the skills, I don't have the talent, and I don't have the interest for it. So for me, this is high demand, and I recognize this, but for me, it's not ideal. And it makes sense that this is this is a uh, very high demand, right? In terms of the infrastructure for dashboards and the problems they solve. Um, and for me, I'm at the point where I'm trying to compromise. So social media. So I'm a social media strategist and that's where I engage professionally the most and that's where most of my income comes from right now. Uh, presentation design. So I used to do a lot of um, reports when I was at Kantar and this is something I think is still close to data viz world, right? And it's still something I can do and contribute. Um, and for me, being in this, at this place, I'm quite happy where I am right now in terms of um, being realistic and also trying to pursue and develop this a little bit more, this idea a bit more. I think I'm still in the middle of the dabble year, the Anne calls. So she, when she first started her practice, she had a dabble. She tried a bunch of things to see what would stick. And um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a full year yet where I, when I left my job. So I'm still in the process exploring. When I first was starting out, um, you know, I did social media as a, as a, on the side for, for income. Um, I had some experience, but very little expertise. And I knew that to increase my value, and also my hourly rate, I had to educate myself. I had to, I had to discipline myself to learn. So what I did um, was I started uh, working just four days a week. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday was when I worked. Wednesday was the day I didn't work. And I told my clients this, I'm not you know, available when focusing on learning. And, and in this day, I will learn things. I will read blog posts. You know, I'll try to learn how to do, you know, I learned SEO. I learned Google Analytics. I learned a bunch of things. More recently, what I've done is I've um, cut down a little bit of social media work and I'm trying to focus more on data viz. So now I'm thinking a bit more about data viz stuff, right? And recently someone asked me a question as, what is data viz design? And I was like, oh, I don't have a really good answer for that. Let me get back to you on that, right? And so I, I spent that Wednesday to articulate my thinking and my thoughts and really you know, discipline myself to, to articulate. And I created this Instagram carousel post, um, which tries to answer that. So now if someone asks me that again, I have a more articulated answer and I've thought about it. I've spent the time to think about it. And I think this is important because if you want to develop yourself into an expert, I think it's important to hone our thinking. So it's really hard to stay motivated, right? And I think I'm still trying to grasp how I want to contribute to the data viz community. But so far, there are two key things that keep me focused. The first is um, I want to create results that only data viz can achieve. And if we communicate through film, essays, or poems, why data viz? And I think this is an important question everyone should ask, right? Is data viz, does it make the most sense to use that right now and why? The second thing is I want to keep making things that only I create, uh, I can create. And I think there's no point in making something that someone else can make, right? And this is something I'm working really hard to figure out um, and take some time right, to just keep exploring, try different things. And the, the key answer to this is really to just be yourself. I think a lot about personal branding, especially when I work with my clients. And surprisingly, it's really hard to be yourself. We always want to be someone else. 
But when you look at people like comedians, musicians, artists, um, they all succeeded by being themselves because they have ownership to their story. They have ownership to some skills that only they can do and no one else can do. And I think if I can figure out how I can do that, and I think not only will I discover my value proposition to the data viz community, but ultimately I think I'll find my value proposition to the world. Thanks so much. So that was my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. You can learn more and visit my website at jamesang.ca. My social media, mostly I'm pretty open, so feel free to reach out. Thanks so much for your time. Take care. Well, thank you, Jane, for the wonderful talk. And uh, we will go to the panel next. If you have any questions for Jane, she will also be a panelist. So you can ask questions during the panel. Um, so next we have Matthew Brammer moderating the panel. Matthew is a visual speci visualization specialist based in Seattle. He is currently a senior research staff member at Tableau. He is interested in visualization design for communication and presentation as well as visualization and interaction design for devices, both large and small. Prior to joining Tableau, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research, which followed his doctoral studies at the University of British, British Columbia. He's passionate about the transfer of ideas between academic researchers and also practitioners and has been a co-organizer of the VIS in practice comp uh, event since 2018. Thanks, Leo. Uh, so yeah, welcome to this panel session. I'm, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with uh, three visualization practitioners. Um, so I wanted to get things started off um, just by my own outlook on uh, visualization freelance and, and consulting work in the broader context of the VIS conference. So VIS in practice has been an event for the past several years. And we've aspired, when, uh, as the conference has moved around, to bring together different voices from the visualization uh, practice community. I would say, however, that a lot of uh, the people we come to speak at this event, uh, we've been overrepresenting large companies and visualization practitioners embedded within larger organizations. I think a voice of um, uh, getting people from the, the freelance and consulting community, uh, they've been, I think, underrepresented within this this forum. And I'm really glad, sort of a, a side effect of the, the pandemic and this virtual conference this year, that we can bring in different voices who wouldn't typically attend uh, the Viz conference uh, and get their take on the state of the field. So I have really, really uh, profound thanks to Kristen, Jane, and Karan for, for joining us here today. Um, what I'd like to get started on, so we've heard a little bit of Jane's origin story in her talk, um, but I would, I would love to hear from Kristen and Curran off the top, just a, a little bit, take a few minutes to talk about your, your path, your, how you landed in this role that you're, you're now in, or the, the visualization freelance and consulting work that you've done in the past. So why don't we start uh, with, uh, with Kristen, and uh, you can tell us a little bit about who you are, what type of work you do, and how you get, got to where you are. Hey, uh, well, I have a very unconventional career path. I, uh, I started when I was a biology student and I realized that I really enjoyed visualizing the, the, the visualization part of my research presentations. And that sort of turned on a light for me. And I, after graduating, I founded a nonprofit for science literacy. And I ran that until, um, ran out of money. Uh, it got very difficult to maintain financially. Um, then I started focusing more on general data visualization. I love programming. I've been programming since I was a kid um, in various languages. I, I love data. I love munging through a messy spreadsheet 
I love swearing at the spreadsheet. Even that part is just so satisfying. And then when it all comes together and it works, it's like, it's euphoric. Um, Mid-career, I went back to school for grad school and in computer science and I got even more code centric and doing um, weird research projects like uh, researching the noise pollution in my life. I'm very sensitive to noise. So like I have to wear noise counseling headphones, even though they look funny, I just can't focus without them. And then that led to a fellowship with Stamen here in San Francisco. And I created a sound map of the Mission District as an art installation. And then that led me to contacts at Mapbox and then boom, and just everything just kind of comes together. And I've worked in corporate settings. I've worked in startup settings. And I'm actually, I'm just happiest when I get to do what I want to work on. And when um, I get to exercise more of my brain and my creativity, when I have more say over what clients I agree to work with. And I'm trying to balance, um, like be myself, follow the things that have paid me back, like this noise pollution, that basically facing that annoyance in my life and studying it and making something beautiful out of it really launched my current career. And the, a corporate setting would never allow me to do something like, has never allowed me to do things like that. And those projects get lots of attention, which bring clients that are more interested in the kind of work that I like to work on. So again, Jane Stock was really fantastic. Your matrix that like moving things from the low demand to the high demand and avoiding the not ideal work because that not ideal work is what kind of kills us. It's not that we don't like mundane things. It's like, I love, fixing a spreadsheet, but it's gotta be a spreadsheet with data I care about or that I find interesting. And that that is a struggle for me, moving those things from low demand to or even just any demand would be nice for some of it. I mean, I'm struggling to get people to sign up for uh, my free stickers and stamps project. I've got about 300 people now that I've mailed them out and I'm creating uh, visualizations of how long it takes the U.S. postal system to get these envelopes to different places. And I've been able to identify a few bottleneck sorting locations. But so that's my pitch. I want you to sign up for a sticker. Hashtag stickers and stamps. <laughs> okay, I've rambled. I'm done. <laughs> Yes, and it will, uh, we'll definitely get a chance at the end uh, as well to, to talk about some uh, of your current initiatives and uh, anything you want to add in the Discord channel, like links to stickers and stamps, for instance, or links oh, to your great. sound map work. Uh, definitely point people there in the Discord and uh, um, we can get some feedback on those as well. Uh, Curran, we'd love to hear uh, about your, uh, your background and how you got into the role that uh, the visualization roles that you've, you've been in. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Curran. I have been in data visualization for quite some time now. Um, I was at UMass Lowell for nine years, bachelor's, master's, PhD. And then I worked uh, around 2015 at a, a tech startup in San Francisco called Alpine Data Labs. Um, and then after that, I started my own company called Data Viz Tech. That was in 2016. And then I um, got married and moved to India where I lived with my wife for four and a half years. So for that time, I was just doing freelancing 100% and it was 100% remote. So I feel like I'm a little ahead of this uh, remote game. <laughs> and that was great. It was great. Um, and recently uh, moved back to the States and 90% of my my gigs was with this, this one firm, Stamen Design in San Francisco. And I recently took on a full-time gig there as their lead design technologist. And that's where I've been for uh, since August, so quite recently. Uh, but it's a pleasure to work with Stamen Design. They have, they have all sorts of projects coming through the door. Uh, 
my expertise is, you know, as the engineer on Teams. So I do a lot of work with JavaScript, uh, React, and D3. And I'm also an educator. I teach this online class with uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute here in Massachusetts, which I've also published as a public free uh, online course on YouTube. There's about 30 something videos there so far. And I also run my own coding platform, uh, vizhub.com. So that's my spiel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for both of you to, to provide the, just your origin story, how you got here. Um, Karen, you mentioned like working in India for a while too. And I, I picked up uh, um, in, in Jane's talk that there was also this narrative from Matt Baker of working in Sri Lanka for a while and just being able to work from wherever. Um, we're most, and perhaps so both of you can probably comment on this because we have some national differences in where you are based. Uh, what's it like working remotely around the world? And what's it like working with perhaps clients in those countries? Did you work with clients in those countries? Or were most of your clients North American based? Uh, what's your take on, on that? Yeah, I could speak to that. Um, while living in India, all of my clients were not in India. Uh, mostly US-based, uh, some UK-based. I did some work for um, UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Agency. Um, I tried to get business with clients in India, but the, the budgets were just not aligned with what I could provide. So I did some like work for free, essentially, for um, this one agri agriculture company in India that had really interesting remote sensor data. Uh, but yeah, it was it was awesome living in India and earning in U.S. dollars because the the purchasing power is quite different. Um, but it was really great uh, a learning experience trying to work 100% remote because you have to focus on things like how do you clearly communicate with people like asynchronously. Uh, we use a lot of Slack, and I have come to almost religiously follow the. Um, Kanban methodology, where we have this Kanban board and like some of the scrum methodology and um, all of that stuff works really well when you're 100 percent remote. Jane, being uh, we have uh, you coming in from Canada, uh, is are, are most of your clients in the States or are they in Canada? Do you, how's your mix of uh, people that you've worked with? When it comes to data viz, there's a lot more interest from states. And Canada is a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um, there doesn't seem to be a culture that's really popular. I know on the west side, you know, BC, it, it's, it's sort of popping. But here it's like where I am in Ontario, um, it's, it's not really there yet. So I feel like it's awesome to earn US dollars. <laughs> Same thing as what Kern said, right? It is. It is um, uh, valued higher than the Canadian dollars, but um, yeah, it, it's just it's, it's it's definitely more market in the states than here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this segues a bit into my next uh, like topic or uh, my own personal recollection is when I was in grad school in the first half of the 2010s, going uh, becoming a visualization specialist or a consultant freelancer. It didn't even seem like that was a thing yet. Like uh, when. When did that, when was the turning point, I think, for each of you? Like, when did you realize, like, hey, that's an actual role, and that's something I could, that could be my, my work, um, versus being a, a broader, like, development or engineering consultant or something, uh, like a media a development consultant. Where was that for you? Because that, that seemed to turn sometime around the, the early two, uh, 2010s, for me at least. Um, I can talk about this first. Um, so. I'm the youngest in the panel <laughs> and I joined data viz much later than they did. Um, so for me, I gained interest of it and aware, awareness of it around 2015, 2016. So that's way past that point. And so I think I've been lucky that at, at that time, a lot of things happened. Um, the big one is, um, you know, Dear Data with Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Kozovic. And then she joined Pentagram. And then there's also Shirley Wu and Nadia Bremer, right? So there's a lot of things happening. And also the pudding came out. Um, so I'm pretty much spoiled. <laughs> um, I would say because 
the people did the work and they, they were able to do what they were doing, that was a turning point for me. So that was, I think my answer is really easy. I'm really curious about what the other two, what it was for them. Okay, uh, I guess mine has been more circuitous. It like, it comes and goes. It's, I mean, I started out really doing science visualization and going to, getting to go to conferences in Oxford and getting to meet people who are the leading experts in cognitive psychology. So the, 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 the in my earliest clients were the chemistry professors and people who are trying to communicate how the atomic world works and how cells communicate. And it's all, um, all of that has come along for the ride. It's like, I've always been writing code and there's always been data. It's just sometimes the presentation of the data, because it's all research results. Sometimes the presentation of that data looks cartoonish because it's like a big, level and I am drawing it with vectors, but then I'm also drawing vectors on a map. So it's it's kind of, I, I think it was probably the, the mid 2010s when I really started calling myself a data visualization consultant because I have always been doing the engineering and the design and the concept communication. For me, um, IEEE Viz. So I, when I was in uh, university days, I had attended IEEE Viz with my lab uh, with George Grinstein, great guy. Um, and so that's when I learned that it's a thing, just because um, at IEEE Viz they had these shout outs to like, oh, you know. Um, Viz and industry or industry partners and I. So it was sort of on the sidelines in my sort of peripheral vision for years and years. Um, and when I got to San Francisco, the D3 meetup was there and that's when it really hit home. Uh, the D3 meetup in 2015, um, that was such an amazing community. And a lot of the people in that community were doing freelancing. And that's when it hit for me like, oh wow, I could do that. Like that, that's actually what I want to do. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be working for a company. Um, I want to bring my own skills to the table and offer, you know, unique services uh, based on data viz. Yeah. And then, and then I just sort of took the plunge in 2016. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to do. And there was a couple of months where I didn't have any work. And I was like, is this even going to work at all? Um, and then it's, then I quickly learned that being an independent person, it's feast or famine. And you know, then I got too much work to handle, and then there was like months of no work. So you know, adjusting to that was a big a big part of it. But uh, yeah, I hope that answers the the query. And, and Karen, that actually uh, ties into a really, really nice question that Jan Eretz uh, posed on the Discord was. Well, to what extent are we looking at survivorship bias here? Uh, how many people out there fail at becoming a visualization practitioner, fr freelancer, or consultant type? Um, and how many can actually make a living from this? And so Jane's talk actually uh, painted a few different examples of how people make a living in different income streams and stuff like that. Um, but it's also interesting to note that, Karen, you're, you're, you've now moved into a different role too. So um, getting your perspectives on that would be interesting to see, like, uh, how many other people you spoke to out there where it didn't work out for them? Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, I have not been able to maintain a freelance career my whole career. There have been times when I had to accept job offers. It, it's... Um, and I have other financial obligations like health insurance for my family. At one point, uh, I, I, I once took this big corporate job where I was an employee, they owned me. I had to do it because my insurance premiums were going up so high, so fast. I, I was paying thousands of dollars a month just to not see a doctor. 
So that, I mean, that that's another reality that um, with ACA passing, being able to buy insurance independently is, a, is not quite as expensive. Like I make too much to get the subsidized version, but it's still not as much as I was paying a, a while ago. So that that's, um, if you don't have kids, you probably aren't thinking about that yet, but it's, it's um, or you might be thinking, or you, a lot of people I spoke to, they get their insurance through their partner. I'm going to add to that. So I think everyone I spoke to did have someone they could rely on. And I think that's a really important aspect that people miss out on. Um, and I think um, a lot of people you don't hear from, right? <laughs> if they didn't make it, right? Um, I, I, I wrote my article not knowing what's going to happen to me, but I wrote it because I was at a good time to write it and to talk about what was happening. And I think um, a very similar situation I'm in, like as, as um, with Kristen Kern, like I'm not really successful as a freelancer, right? But in data this specifically, which is why I did social media on the side, that was the thing that kind of, it's important to really engage professionally and sense of like, there's something weird about being employed where you feel like you have to be useful it's really hard to pin that feeling, but if you're not really making an income, you really feel like your worth is tied to that. And I think for me, still being professionally engaged on the social media side for me was really, really important. And it, it's what kept me motivated. And I think that's like a really important aspect you don't see. It's, it's the motivation. It's all the, you know, um, the thing that happens in your head, right? And um, it's just something that's hard to see. And a lot of people don't talk about it too. So I think that's also what, what makes this panel really, um, really helpful for others. Yeah, I can speak to that too. Um, what Kristen was saying really resonates with me personally. Um, and by the way, I feel like I have failed. I mean, I joined full time with Stamen for many reasons. Um, so when I started the whole freelancing thing, uh, I was living in India. And so the, the feast or famine aspect was manageable because during the feast times, I could, you know, you know, squirrel away a bunch of cash uh, to get us through the famine times. But after having moved back to the U.S. and now we have a three-year-old daughter to support, it's really tough to, to pay all the bills doing freelancing. And so uh, most of the freelancers that I have encountered have been uh, single, I think, I, I think, I'm pretty sure. Um, because to, yeah, to support a family with freelancing, you have to really hustle and you really have to be, be highly skilled and charge a lot to your clients. Otherwise it's sort of, uh, you know, you could moonlight and make a little bit of extra cash in addition to the full-time job, but it's tough. It's tough. So I don't really consider myself ultimately a successful freelance person. Um, and and a, a lot of it was things like health insurance. You know, after we moved to the U.S., health insurance was was a huge thing for us. So that was one of the big factors for actually deciding to join a company full time. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed uh, in some of the discussion that has taken place in the Data Visualization Society and the and the discussions that preceded that was about. Um, a lot of the visualization freelancers that we see speaking at conferences at places like Open Viz or other ones like that, they, they, they put a lot of effort into presentation and doing public appearances to promote themselves. And we don't hear from a lot of the, the great visualization practitioners that, are, that don't, uh, aren't as extroverted perhaps. Um, and so if you are, if there are people listening on the call or if there are students who don't see themselves as um, wanting to go out and be that extrovert and to do talks uh, and things like that. What are some strategies to uh, still grow your network and, and get, uh, get work? Um, I would say write, 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 write. Write it all down, document. I mean, I've saved my own behind many times by documenting my process that I thought I wasn't going to have to use again but I had to come back to it a year or so later. I'm like, oh, that's how I did it. Okay, does that library still exist? Can, uh, do I need to update the library or did GitHub take it down? It's uh, write, write, write and share as much as you can. And do try to give talks. Don't think of it as, because um, I'm actually an introvert. I'm not an extrovert. 
think of it as a way to start conversations. It's really hard for me to, to just calmly start a conversation with somebody. I'm either like way too energetic or withdrawn or, and it takes me a while to warm up, but giving a talk about something that you feel confident about and you're proud of, that gives people something to start a conversation with you about. And that helps you build your network. I wouldn't be able to do anything I do now if I didn't give talks, even though they kill me. Um, I can add to that. So sure. I do social media. So I, I think a lot about this. And what's nice about doing social media work is I get to watch other people's businesses and understand what works and what doesn't work. So if you're, um, so I'm also similar to Kristen. I'm not an extrovert. Um, but I think the most important thing when you're creating um, content, so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be talks, it could be writing, right? I think writing is really important. Um, I'm here because I wrote an article. <laughs> this is a good example, right? I wrote because I wrote, I wrote an article and it gave a lot of people value. And first of all, I was very curious. I was trying to solve my problem. And then because I didn't selfishly keep it to myself, I shared it with the whole community and now you all benefit from it, right? So giving value is really important. Um, giving talks is really hard, but it does become easier as you practice. It's like when you drive, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. It's really scary but you'll get more comfortable with it. I hate being in front of a camera. I'm actually like really nervous right now. It doesn't come through, but I'm like shaking. Um, but practicing being in front of a camera is like something that does take time and it's, it's very possible. Um, so um, for, for people who are you know a little younger in my generation, you probably do lots of, if you do on Instagram or Snapchat, you do lots of selfies, you know, like that actually does help. <laughs> So, um, you know, when I'm going on Instagram, doing Instagram story, like sharing my process and I get better at communicating, um, you know, that across. So it does take practice. And um, just because you're introverted doesn't mean you can't do it. And as long as it's something you care about, I think you, you'll get better with it. So it just takes some time. Totally. Yeah, I would echo all of that and say inbound marketing is huge. Um, if you create and share publicly exceptional content that nobody else has ever made before, you're going to attract people. Uh, and yes, blog posts, but also, you know, I, I'm a huge proponent of open source data viz work. Um, you know, if you did a course project or whatever, or did a side project, or just tried to solve one particular problem, if you put your stuff out there, put your code out there on, you know, blocks.org or observable or set up your own little website, uh, that is huge. Uh, and also, you know, people do look at your GitHub profile. I know as now that I'm on the hiring end, now I'm in the business of hiring freelancers to work with Damon. <laughs> And one of the things we look at is what is the public portfolio of work? You know, what does their GitHub history look like? Are they even doing anything in there? And so, yeah, that's what I would say is just make open source data viz projects, write blog posts about it. And um, even YouTube is a great avenue, you know, put together a little presentation, put it on YouTube for each and every project that you've done. Yeah, put yourself out there and, uh, and, and that, that's a, a very good strategy. This, this recent discussion I, dovetails just, really well into um, a question that Bernice Rogowitz asked on, on uh, YouTube about your personal branding strategy, like beyond uh, like encompassing your entire marketing that we've just been talking about with either through talks or through blog posts or the projects that you undertake in your portfolio how do you highlight those so are you conscious of this strategy as you pick projects as you highlight them as you as you uh, advertise them uh, and she adds to the question um, what are some strategies for marketing yourself that don't make you feel miserable I'll tackle this one um, most of my uh, client work is actually under NDAs. Some of my coolest work, I can't show anyone. I can't, uh, it, it, it's really heartbreaking. <laughs> Same but, here, it's a bummer. Yeah, so what I do is 
I create my own projects that I care about. Like if there's a data set that has some similarities and the client's like, okay, it's, yeah, you can do an open version of it. That doesn't happen very often because it's really hard to find a comparable data set to use things. Um, but sometimes it does. Like um, I created some maps of all the street trees in San Francisco because it had a similar distribution to other infrastructure things that I was mapping at the time. And that, um, yeah, that got some attention and got some other clients for me. Um, but usually the getting attention and the branding, it really, it, it's the focus on the things that get me excited or that I can't put down or, or stop working on. Those are the ones that I think turn out the best and are not intentionally branding and I'm having fun. And then those bring me more of similar work. It, it's like, it's just a circle that goes round and round. And like Jane said, be yourself. And that that's your branding. Okay, so social media, right? I, I, I specialize in personal branding. Um, and the best way to understand personal branding, it is everywhere. And celebrity is a great example of personal branding, right? Who, who do you think of when you look at a celebrity? What do you think about them? Um, a brand is what your, your gut feeling about that brand. Um, it's not what the, brand, the company says or what that person says, it's what you think about them. And to influence what you think about them, you portray things, you communicate your message, right? Coca-Cola, right? Think about that, you know, open the happiness, things like that. So this is, the, this is when I talk about branding, I tell clients, it's like, think about how you want to portray yourself. And when you put out work that you want others to see, that's a great example of attracting people you want to attract. Um, so I, I, I work a lot in social media. And one thing I would say people underutilize is LinkedIn. I go really hard on LinkedIn. Um, I think Twitter is really great for peer community from my experience so far. There's a lot of peers there for people. If you want a community, if you want to talk to other people, share ideas, if you want to attract clients and start building that, LinkedIn is a really great place. I know for some other people, if you're really good at um, showing work um, through Instagram, Instagram is also another avenue. So I think those two are things to, to look into. YouTube is also really great in terms of video and showing process. Um, so I think showing a process and um, being very active on those platforms and engaging with people and uh, making sure you're talking, you know, in, in ways that's not filled with jargon is really important as well. I, I want to, uh, I want to zero in on this idea of public versus private work, because I think it's a, something that a lot of people experience. Uh, especially freelancers, because oftentimes when you enter an agreement with a client, you're bound to some terms that say, okay, whatever I produce for this client will be solely owned by this client when, when I'm done and I can't share it publicly. And so I personally come to this strategy of sort of anticipating the, the problems that I'm going to have to solve for a particular client and then solving those problems off the clock as open source and then putting those out into the world and then using those as input to solve the problem for the client, but also showcase that solution that I've come up with in some kind of public facing uh, sort of uh, open source work with public data that's sort of similar to the client work but it doesn't have anything really to do with the client but that way i don't end up in a situation where i've worked for like a whole year and i have nothing to show for it you know which often happens when you're doing freelance work so i, I think it's important to build in some kind of strategy to produce public facing work while also meeting the needs of the clients. And like Kristen said, it's this like uh, this cycle of sorts where the work that you do for a client can be reflected in public work, which then gets noticed by future clients. And that's, I think, one of the keys of, of having, having freelancing be a, a sustainable uh, path. 
Thanks, Karen. I think that also probably would resonate with some people in the research community here where they are working on a research problem that has uh, private data or in, especially in medical or health related contexts that you can't share the visualization you create or the code that you create uh, when it's tied to that content, but you might find an analogous problem and that's what ends up show being written about in the research paper that gets presented at this conference is uh, you can sometimes tell by reading these papers that they're actually solving a different problem that they can't talk about. Yeah, it's it's a perfect analogy. The same it applies to research as well. Totally. So I want I want to switch gears a little bit to a couple of uh, interesting questions, uh, sort of logistical questions that have come up on the Discord channel for each of you. Um, Daniel Zafir asks a, a question about your timescales, about your projects. Like, uh, how do you determine the timescales of your projects? What timescales of these projects tend to run over? Uh, how varied is that? Um, Anyone want to tackle that first? I can speak to that. Um, I find that four months is a sweet spot uh, for me personally. If it goes on more than that, it's like, oh God, when is this going to end? <laughs> like, uh, but it often does. I mean, I had one project that went on for an entire year. Um, and it depends on client expectations too. I mean, so I, I usually organize work in terms of a statement of work where we, I work with the client to scope out what exactly needs to get done into you know fairly fairly fine grained detail, but not not so fine grained detail we, that, we, that we have to solve the problem before we get the statement of work signed off on. And um, I find that the Scrum methodology is is hugely beneficial when it comes to working with clients and, and getting them what they need at the time that they need it. Because often uh, there's some all sorts of quotes about how plans don't work out. And I find that it really is true um, in this line of work. And so I emphasize this idea of iterating, of starting in something, showing it to the client, getting feedback, and then iterating and iterating with this feedback loop. Because without that feedback loop, it often happens where you you go for months and build something and then you share it after two months passed with the client and then and then only after having built it you find out it's not what they actually wanted <laughs> and then that's how projects go on and on and on forever and so um yeah and then there's also techniques for cutting off the long tail of a project where you get like 90 percent of it done but then there's 10 percent of it that seems to take just forever um, and so oftentimes towards the end of a project, I find I have to work more hours to just say, okay, I'm going to get it done and get it done like in the next two weeks. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's my take. I would add that, uh, data quality and data issues from data provided by the client can cause horrific complications. And um, yeah, guard yourself. Always have a line item in there saying all statement of work terms are dependent on the, on the data being usable upon receipts. Like it has to be, like if I have to go dig through the US Census Bureau to get the data you want because your data has errors, like massive errors, um, then we have to talk. <laughs> it's, it's, I cannot be held accountable for your data quality issues. And that's very, very hard uh, to, to negotiate. And because, you know, I, I like to get things done and I want to just like, okay, I'll take care of it. But that's, that's when you lose money. That's when you start suffering. And the, if the client doesn't learn, they'll never be able to do another project like this with say another freelancer. Like it, it's, I mean, part of our job is educating the client because they don't have in-house help for that. Totally. And I just want to sort of add a little addendum to that. It's like, sometimes the clients ask you to do the work without giving you the data. 
<laughs> and that to me is a huge red flag. It's like, well, you want me to visualize your data, but then you're not gonna give me your data. So you want me to find some, like any data to visualize and like pretend that I have data. And so I have tried that and it doesn't work at all. Like sometimes they say, oh, you simulated data. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not gonna do it. Like that's where I draw the line and say, look, you must provide data. Otherwise, you know, we can't visualize the data if I don't have access to it. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> Um, so I think it's important he mentioned statement of work. I think, you know, every, having things written out is really important and also having conditions that penalize clients for doing things that's not okay, like just making you do rework, you should charge more for that. That's something I learned as well from talking to other people is you charge a little more for things like that. Um, it's important to, I think this idea of what we're talking about is managing the client, you know, and the provider relationship is really, really important. And a lot of times they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> And so I think education is a key part of that and, and managing scope. I think managing timelines, because I think they don't know the process. And a lot of times we, don't, we can't reveal the process. We can't talk about what we do, right? A lot of times behind closed doors. So you can't really blame them for not understanding that. This is gonna take two weeks, not two days, right? So I think um, education is really, really important in keeping things within timelines. And you can also do stacked statement of works where I, I also, that's a great approach too that I've used some, sometimes when the scope is not entirely clear, uh, but it's clear how to start it. And so I'll say, look, here, I, I can put together a statement of work for like one month's worth of work. And like, let's just start there. And then after doing that work, everything, all the pieces of feedback that come up during that month, all, every time it's like, it's not in that statement of work, I'm like, okay, that's needs to go in a new statement of work. And so all the feedback ends up piling into like this new statement of work for the next month of work, have the client sign off on that. And then it's this perpetual, uh, you know, new statement of work, new statement of work until they're satisfied or they run out of money. This timeline of four months, but, but having it be a little bit flexible in terms of time, time for data cleaning and a little bit of back and forth, or maybe taking it month by month, at least initially. Um, maybe that resonates with some of the, 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 the researchers in this community too, because we, we tend to be on a um, conference deadline circuit where we're having a couple, or maybe two or three conferences that the visualization community is revolving around every year and they're spaced about four months apart and people are trying to get into that groove of just working in four month chunks. I'm curious, Karen, but because you also had a, a foot in this community uh, several years ago, whether that was much of an adaptation to go from that research conference cycle to freelance and consulting work. Well, I'll I'll keep it short and sweet. Like I I I never felt like I was a successful paper writer, and I was never really hooked into that routine. It was always my dream to like, okay, I'm going to publish papers, but like I never never quite got there. So I I cannot honestly relate. So I, I don't know, maybe others would have something to add. I always did posters at conferences. It's less pressure than, than a paper and it's visual. I made sure my posters were gorgeous and, and enticing and bring you in to look at things and then and keep it simple. You just have a few visual points and then obvious cues to start conversations because it, research conferences, my favorite sessions are the poster sessions because people are just milling about with snacks and drinks and talking and they come to you and ask you questions about your beautiful poster. It's better than a paper, I think, for me as an introvert. So the flip side to the, the, the time and project length question, time and then money. Uh, another question that came up on the, the Discord channel was about um, when you're consulting for these external projects, John Alexis Guerra Gomez is asking about whether it's uh, common to charge by the hour, charge by the project, or maybe is it charging by the month? What other strategies there for, um, for charging clients? Okay, I'll go first. I usually do by the hour and um, just because I scope out the project and then I figure out 
how many hours I think it's going to cost. And then I tell them my hourly rate and they faint or they go away and I never hear from them again. Um, honestly, telling them the hourly rate at the beginning has saved me a lot of heartache and pain um, because if they're not willing to pay my rate, you know, I'm not willing to work for them for free. And I actually live in San Francisco. It's expensive here. And I've heard that men often will get around to the money talk later, but uh, I find that um, I'm too giving. I guess I'm acculturated to be more helpful and giving, and I end up spending too much time getting to the, the scope of the work, and then they think it's going to be $3,000, and it's really $30,000, and they, they just have no concept. So if I get them thinking bigger numbers early on, regardless of it's by the week, by the month, by the hour, th then they, they either commit or they go. Yeah, I can speak to this. Too. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Um, I was just going to say, so I think from my understanding and doing my own research, um, I find pricing one price for a project makes sense if it's something you've already done before, because you can anticipate the problems that's going to come up. So for example, you know, if you're a lawyer, my mom works in an office, so um, as a paralegal, and for her, all her cases are very similar. So she knows exactly what price to give each time, right? When you're doing something data viz, it's impossible to to predict everything, and never not it's not always the same. So it's it's really really hard to give a fixed rate. I think um, unless you are very familiar with your clients and what kind of work you can expect. Um, for example, people who do editorial work, right? That's very predictable, um, and you you know you can kind of estimate how much time you're going to put into it. If it's something completely new, a lot of people will either do hourly or they might do like a I think. They might do like a day rate, for example. I've heard that one done as well. So there's many ways to approach it. It really depends on the project. And I don't think you should do one approach. Um, really consider the pros and cons of each and um, think about which one makes sense. I think that's important. I, I found it depends on the client too. I've been doing both. And um, it's, it's a game you have to play. <laughs> as a, a freelancer or as a consultant. And it's the same thing that uh, consultancies do as well, like Stamen essentially is a consultancy where <clears throat> companies hire <clears throat> Stamen to do projects. And um, the way I've seen it done a lot of the time, I'd say the majority of the time, is that we scope out the work and we give a, a rough estimate in terms of the number of hours that it would take to get the work done. And then we charge an hourly rate based on the estimated effort. And so it's, it, it essentially becomes a fixed price contract where the, the, the client pays a fixed price for the entire thing. And then the challenge, the game to play is, okay, how do we get the work done in like one, in like two thirds of that time, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and there's a lot of unpredictability. Some projects run over budget and that's what you don't want to happen. But when it does, I mean, so, sometimes you just have to do it and put in the extra hours and finish it up and lose money on certain projects. And that's like sort of a harsh reality that you just have to try to avoid. Uh, you can often avoid it by just taking your original estimate and like doubling it and telling the client that's what the estimate is. Uh, and it ends up being fairly accurate. <laughs> Um, or as a freelancer, as an individual freelancer, it is quite common to charge hourly, which works out great. It works out great, uh, but it, it is a source of unpredictability from the client's perspective. So that's why clients tend to gravitate towards fixed price engagements. Um, and this is where also the, the idea of scaling up comes in because if you're doing consulting for years, like chances are you you may want to parcel out some of the work to another another freelancer that you hire. And, and this is how Stamen works, by the way, is Stamen often does these fixed pricing engagements that are very large and then parcels out the work to three or four individual freelancers who strictly charge an hourly rate. 
And so then it's the, it, the statement has to play this game of, you know, do we, how do we come in under budget and deliver a really good product? Uh, and it's, it's this balancing act that has to be performed. Really nice. Uh, there was a follow-up question about software, about estimating hours um, that came in on Discord from, from Sean McKenna. Um, estimation in software engineering is a really tricky endeavor and uh, estimates are most often wrong. Um, so how do you find your estimates are changing over time? And like, do you have any other tricks for uh, like doubling to estimate hours or any stories to tell from, from <laughs> past projects where this has happened? Erin mentioned earlier about iterative development processes. Um, this comes in really handy. Uh, something I like to do is to do a prototype statement of work, just where uh, we start exploring what technical things are possible, what needs to be learned, what needs to be um, given up on. Like some things just won't work. Um, exploring other possibilities. It's really a brainstorming portion and I do that I say okay let's um, let's do a statement of work of a prototype we'll get as far as we can in one week what can we do and we do the back and forth and then at the end of that time we can then say well do we want to continue or what parts of this project are we going to focus on and what do we have to give up on and that if we, if you can get the client to participate in an iterative segmented, progression, it works better for everyone, but it's not always easy to convince them of this. It's, <laughs> it's part of the challenge. Totally. Another uh, interesting question that came up on Discord, um, I wanna switch gears a little bit to talk about the broader visualization practitioner community and, and other freelancers, um, which, which is nice to see that um, Stamen also uses other freelancers as part of that process. But the uh, question comes from John Sasko uh, from Georgia Tech uh, is, how much time do you spend looking at your competitor's work? And like, or does that bias you? Or do you try to avoid that? Um, what's your approach there? Competitors will also send overflow to you. So keeping an eye and competitors can also be people that you send overflow to as well. If you don't yeah. think of your so-called competitors as competition, think of them as, as um, experts that you can, that can help each other grow and do they, they'll inspire you, they'll give you work, you give them work. We would, I'm always amazed that I inspire people because um, I'm usually busy being inspired. <laughs> so don't think of them as competition, that's unhealthy. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I've often had too much work and then, and then handed it off to like, like Kristen said, overflow. That's a good way to think about it. I've never used that term, but yeah, overflow. If you if you have too much work and then something new comes, hand it off to someone you've seen doing really good work and posting it on Twitter. And then that person is your friend. <laughs> and then they give you work. Yeah, it's totally. But, but yeah, I, I always spend a little chunk of time nearly every day just perusing the latest on uh, blocks.org, the latest on observable, the latest in uh, hashtag data viz on Twitter, just to see like who is doing the best work nowadays because it's a constantly shifting link. Uh, but the same names come up over and over again. And uh, it's just really good to be aware of, of the whole space and what people are doing. Um, and often when I find something cool, uh, then I try to go off and reproduce it. I'm like, how do they do that? You know, make a little open source example, spend like a half hour or whatever just to make something, put it out there. And then that's a statement like, yes, I too can do that fancy stuff that those other people are doing.
just want to make sure that Jane, do you have anything to add about um, looking at? Let's not say them, call them competitors anymore. Let's say, uh, how do you look at others, uh, friends, collaborators, potential overflow partners? Uh, how do you spend uh, the, that time? I think a lot of it is keeping up to date because at the end of the day, to clients, we are the experts. So we have to stay up to date with what's happening, right? We have to know what's happening in general. Um, I think for me also, I'm still very early in my career and I don't know who my competitors are. <laughs> Right, because the thing is, I'm still trying to find my market or my niche, and that's really hard to do. It's not something you can just force out. It does take time, and so for me, I don't have much to add to that. But I think it's right. It's it's like what Kristen and Karen have said is true. It's like we're all really. It's a small community. We kind of know each other in general, and there's enough work to go around. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to do, and there's not enough of us to meet the demand. I think from my experience so far. This also reminds me of a question that Kristen, you asked over Slack uh, over, over the past few days was um, having a network of overflow collaborators to rely on maybe a way of maybe um, dealing with all of the, uh, how to deal with situations where there's just too much work and when you're just over, overloaded. Do you have other strategies that you go to for reducing uh, the amount of work that you have on your plate? Uh, uh, maybe Kern or Jane can expand on that or anything beyond looking to the, your overflow network? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to tell clients that it's gonna take longer than expected. And, and that's, that can be a tough discussion to have, but yeah, when I'm swamped, it just can't, can't deliver everything that I originally promised, which is, a, it's a bad position to be in, but uh, as a, independent uh, person, you do end up there sometimes. So um, just having a straight talk with the client, like, look, your deliverable is going to be delayed by two weeks. Um, and I, I personally have a tendency to commit, to overcommit. And that's something that I've learned over the years of like, oh, I think I can do like four things this week. But in reality, it's, you can only do like two. <laughs> and so I, I find myself just having to say no more often than I would uh, sort of naturally want to. And so, yeah, having that ability to throttle the things coming in the door is key. I think I heard a really great quote from Stephanie Evergreen. So you, you might've heard of Evergreen Academy. She does lots of really good work in teaching people um, data viz, but she said, if you're getting too much work, it's time to raise your rates. And I thought that was a really good like I think a really good um, tactic to increase your value and also get clients you want to work with. Um, so if that does happen. That's a really good tactic to approach with. Well, another good question that potentially ties into this of reducing complexity, reducing workload is having a reusable workflow or pipeline. And uh, Jan Ertz, who asked a question earlier, also posed this question about like how important is it in your work to have this reusable workflow pipeline for different projects, how transferable are, are, are these across uh, client work? I, it really depends on the kind of client. Like I do a lot of analysis with Python and you know I can do a lot of copy pasting. I wouldn't, um, or save as a different version. And I just swap out the file that goes in, especially when I'm trying to just look over the data and find some basic patterns to begin with. That, that's pretty easy to work, work through. Um, I'm also much more comfortable with command line, um, terminal based running Python and um, JavaScript in the browser to console print and all that, all that. Um, I, that's a workflow that I'm more comfortable with coming from a computer science background. Things like observables work better for a different workflow. Like I find it challenging to um, take things from an observable notebook and then make it functional in another setting. So I like to, like all that, it's set up stuff, like where the file is, how you load it. Um, I like to, create like a basic template first that is going to be functional. And then I just add things into that. Does, did that make sense at all? 
Yeah. Flow is hard to talk about and make sure that other people understand it because it's all in my head. <laughs> yeah, along those lines, I mean, what I was talking about earlier about spinning off open source public stuff from the client work, uh, that not only serves as inbound marketing, but it also serves a very practical purpose of feeding into future work. I mean, I can't tell you how many times a client comes along with a problem. And then I was like, oh, I've actually solved that almost exact same problem in the past. And I have like a thing on blocks.org. And then that becomes the starting point for the next project. Um, and nowadays I'm using VizHub for that, uh, which is designed with the you know, standard ES6 modules and everything. And so nowadays that's my go-to like sandbox of sorts of like, oh, if you, you need a line chart, I'll just pull out this React component and plug it into your thing. Uh, or you need a map, I'll just drop this thing in. And that's, um, that's how I've sort of leveraged the commonalities between projects, which there's a lot of conceptual overlap between client projects in the data viz space, because it's all, you know, data viz. <laughs> And um, there's also a lot of technical overlap because you can use the same tools and technologies and, and template examples, so to speak, uh, to roll into these various client projects. Yeah. And uh, in terms of um, the, the workflow, I found that Kanban inside of GitHub, the, the GitHub projects feature, that's my go-to tool nowadays. So, you know, translate the statement of work into a bunch of issue GitHub issues and then review that weekly with the client and have that, you know, have thing, have those issues migrate from the to do column to in progress to done. That I find is a tremendously successful and reusable workflow. Yeah, I've used Trello uh, before to manage like workflow and manage tasks. It has been successful. It really depends who you're working with, but I think it also does depend, I think, as Percy said, like the client. So I think um, this is where it's helpful to niche down, where if you have like one client from one industry compared to another industry, their problems might be similar, but won't be exact same. So it's hard to replicate the solution for that. So I think it is important to also kind of focus um, or target who you want to work with. So I'm conscious of the, of the time, we're going to wrap up very quickly here in the next few minutes. Uh, so I want to all thank you again, but I, um, uh, before I do that, I think I have one more question to pose to each of you. S since we're at the IEEE Viz conference, there's a lot of visualization researchers attending this conference and, 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 and hopefully watching this panel session. Um, my question is, well, what ask do you have for the visualization research community that would improve your workflow? Or what technical or methodological expertise are you looking for from or would benefit from uh, benefit your work from this research community? How should we best help you? Better educate clients <laughs> or help, help us to um, create better data literacy in the general community and um, yeah, pu pu public uh, or even li like just really solid proof that cognitive science is real and that how we perceive different shapes and signals, um, but not not just from a like breaking it down into all the marks and signal things, but translating some of that that research into publicly accessible uh, discussion. Because it's hard to be always having to have that discussion with clients. I think a lot about ASAP Science. I'm not sure if anyone know about the YouTube channel. ASAP Science is really popular. They're actually based in Toronto, um, but they translate a lot of research papers and they just make it into accessible YouTube videos. And I think it'd be great to see more of that from data viz community in general. Um, for me, it's always hard to navigate papers. I try my best to read papers as much as possible, but it's really hard to navigate. And I think if it's hard for me, and I do have a science background, it's probably a lot harder for someone who doesn't have that background. So I think um, I think more accessible communication mediums like YouTube or videos would be very helpful, I think. I'll interrupt just to plug the multiple views blog Daniel Zephyr uh, mentioned here on the Discord. 
so if you are a visualization researcher in the audience and if you have a paper at Viz this year, write a blog post about your paper. Publish it on somewhere like multiple views on Medium or elsewhere on the web so that the broader community can see it. Sorry, Curran, so, I might have interrupted you. Yeah, to respond to that, uh, my plea to the DataViz community is, I would like more tools for very rapid prototyping of visualizations and exploratory data analysis. Uh, one of my favorite tools of all time is Data Voyager from Jeff Hare's group. Uh, it was like two year, three years ago or so. I use it almost on every single new project because you can just drop the data set in and it's got this infinite scroll of like suggested visualizations. And uh, I, I want more stuff like that where you can just drop in a data set and it'll say, based on you know the established rules of how marks and channels map to attribute types and human cognition based on all these years of research, we will suggest to you all these different visualizations. And ideally I could just pick one of those up and have an implementation of it that is easily extendable and tweakable so that you could add interactions and drop it into different websites. And uh, that's, that's what I would hope to you know, use from the, the research community. And as we close, I just want to say thank you for putting this together. It's been a, a real pleasure. Well, thank you each again for taking an hour with us today at the Viz conference. Hopefully we can all see each other in person at some point in, in the near future at a, at a conference somewhere and talk more about visualization. I feel like we could go on for quite a lot longer. There's a, a number of other interesting questions that are on the Discord. So if you're able to please uh, join us in the Discord afterwards. We have a break now uh, for the next half an hour. And then the last session uh, of Fizz and Practice is gonna kick off uh, at um, two o'clock mountain time with three more invited talks uh, of practitioners, I believe also for, from the Salt Lake City area. Um, so again, thank you very much um, for participating today, uh, Karen, Jane, and Kristen. Uh, any last plugs you wanna do for your own work or uh, links that you wanna to send to uh, put a, a place, please place in the Discord or um, where to send people to your work? Yes, please look for, search for a hashtag stickers and stamps sign up for a sticker. I will mail one to you through the postal, the US Postal Service, and then you tell me when it arrives. You can also request that I send you an envelope so you can send something back to me. And we have a return trip, travel time tracking. This is, um, I'm doing, this is a labor of love. This is, I'm loving our postal system. Um, please do it. Uh, check out vizhub.com. Um, so you can find my stuff and my work on my website at janezang.ca. Um, I talk a lot about my career journey, although it's very short compared to Henry and Kern, but I, I'm very transparent about things I do. Um, I do have a newsletter where I talk about more in depth about things like like money and you know what it's like working in um, data viz as an independent. Um, I think there's a hunger for this kind of content and I'm happy to share it. So check it out if you have some time. And um, I'd love to also answer questions in Discord. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great rest. Data videos are quite popular nowadays. They usually show changes in the data. However, Creating a data video requires multiple skills, and the process is usually laborious and iterative. Our approach focuses on automatic and interactive visual enhancement of important changes in time series data with data video. Hands-on cybersecurity training represents a domain where vision analytics can significantly improve the impact of teaching process. We describe this new application domain and introduce a conceptual model that can serve as a framework for the development of analytical visualizations. Unified training lifecycle will be discussed from the perspective of different user roles.
we present TransPhys, a design study that is proposed to analyze and integrate close and distant reading of multiple translations. TransPhys presents the overview of the collection to capture global patterns that is facilitated by the ADM web matrix. TransPhys integrates a detailed view to explore interesting path of alignments. We also propose the TLC view to examine and explore the terms of the user selected path to justify and reason the AD analysis. Uh, testing environment for continuous color maps. Many other fields in the computer science do it, we should do it too. With our work, we introduce the approach of using test functions as a standard evaluation method. We present a test suite for continuous color maps implemented in the CCC tool. Adapt the tests to your requirements at the interactive testing section and observe them at the testing evaluation section. Entities and their changing relationships can be modeled more precisely as temporal hypergraphs. But hypergraph models are difficult to explore and refine. By leveraging domain-specific geometric deep learning models and a new multi-level hypergraph visualization, our technique allows for the direct integration of domain knowledge into the machine learning process. The multivariate hypergraph model structure can be analyzed in different abstraction levels. Simultaneously, experts can integrate their domain knowledge on the fly and then explore the refined machine learning model. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that let users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism. We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. We asked participants to recreate bar graphs. When the bar was alone, we saw a different pattern of error than when the bar was presented with context in a stacked bar graph. We find that absolute error increased for higher bars when they were presented alone. We also found that there was a bias in the responses such that they were repulsed from an implicit 50% mark. We found a magic number, 10%, to predict error. Participants are usually within 10% of the height of the bar. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Do these three essays construct their argumentation similarly? Where in this table of argumentation data from the previously seen texts can I find certain argumentation patterns? Do these three argument maps depict the same argument? We have developed a visual analysis system for argumentation in essays that can answer these questions at a glance. You want to know how it works? Come to my talk. We demonstrate that people can use the spatial cues available in 